Hi everyone, good morning. My name's Jen with Slow Garden Center. Welcome to our Saturday morning webinar with the dynamic duo, as I like to call them, Suzanne Bontempo and Charlotte Canner from Our Water, Our World, or Oh Wow. Um, I'm really excited for their presentation. They've always got a ton of really great information to share. And um, they're gonna be talking about fall is for planting because it is, it's time. Uh, now is the t a really exciting time in the garden to get everything ready and in the ground and um, you know prepare for fun spring flowers and whatnot. So this is a really great time and we're happy to have you join us. I do want to um, note that I have a poll going on. So if you could take a moment and hop over to fill out the poll, there's some information that we'd like to gather before the presentation. Um, and then also, if you have any questions, feel free to feed them into the Q&A portion. What's nice with the three of us is that there's always two people to be sifting through the questions. Um, and so we're able to get a lot of uh, questions answered and information out there and whatnot. And we really wanna be sure to address as many of your questions as possible. Um, we have a big group today, so, uh, Putting the questions through the Q&A is the best method. Um, and I also want to note that this is being recorded and the recording will be available on uh, Tuesday, which is September 21st. I also want to note that you should have received a bunch of resource information on an email that was sent out about an hour ago. And so there's a uh, handout shopping list, everything pertaining to this class um, that you would have received. Let me know if you didn't. I can put a link in the chat. Um, what was that? Oh, but underneath the recording, all of that information will be available as well on Tuesday. Um, and then I just want to note a couple of our upcoming classes. We have hydrangea care and pruning on um, September 25th at 10 a.m. So, and that's with Elizabeth Ruiz and she is an incredible pruner. So um, tons of knowledge. So that is really awesome class to look for. And then um, we're gonna do uh, Orchid Basics. And that's gonna be on October 2nd with the San Francisco Orchid Society, um, October 2nd at 10 a.m. Okay, let's look at the poll, okay. Uh, one person didn't receive. Okay, so I'm gonna put the info, uh, one moment and I'll put the outline info in the chat. Okay, uh, let's just see the result of the poll. Um, okay, so have you heard of Oh Wow before? 72% said no. So we're happy to have you join us and learn about this incredible program. And um, Charlotte and Suzanne will uh, tell you more about that. And then where are you located? 43% um, are in Contra Costa. These polls are always weird to look it up, okay. 20% uh, San Francisco, 17% Marin. So that's great. Um, how did you hear about this webinar? Email, 92%. And then what level of gardener do you consider yourself? We all are excited for this question. I, we like to ask it. Um, and so 37% are beginner gardeners and we're so happy you're here. I, you're like baby gardeners. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so we're happy that you're here to join us and that you're learning, um, excited to learn. 47% are intermediate and 16% uh, are experienced and they're just here to geek out for an hour. So that's super awesome. And then what do you use to water your garden? 90% is municipal water and 5% is recycled water or gray water. So awesome, thank you very much for participating. And I do see a bunch of people did not receive the, um, 
the uh, resource link. So I'm going to, I'll put that in the chat right now. And I'm going to start talking and turn it over to Suzanne and Charlotte. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really happy, happy to have you all here this morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Jen. We always love being able to join you all and help uh, it, support you in your uh, path to being a wonderful uh, gardener. It is a lot of fun. Um, I just want to thank Slope for inviting us to uh, provide this uh, information to you today. Fall is for planting. We are both IPM advocates and educators for the Our Water, Our World program. And since SLOAT is uh, throughout three counties, Contra Costa, Marin, and San Francisco, our Our Water, Our World sponsorship is uh, from Contra Costa Clean Water Program in Contra Costa County, uh, the Marin Countywide Stormwater Pollution Prevention Agency in Marin, and in San Francisco, our sponsorship is uh, from the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. So we really appreciate all of that support. And our uh, agenda today, our program, we're going to go through slides for about an hour, uh, and then we will leave time for your questions at the end. And as Jen mentioned, please type your questions into the Q&A as they come up because uh, we will get to them. And it's also nice that you don't have to be distracted about thinking about your question and then, oh, I forgot it. What we're going to talk about or what we're going to learn is why fall is the best time to add new plants to our garden. And planning now for the rainy season, which is so wonderful because we've even gotten a tiny, tiny little bit of rain already. We're hoping to get a lot more, of course. And then we're going to discuss seasonal pest prevention. And specifically, we're going to talk about IPM practices, IPM uh, uh, pest problem solving uh, practices for ants, gophers, and raccoons. So just a little samples to show us how we do that. And for those of you that are not aware of the Our Water, Our World program, I'm very excited to share that this is a national award-winning program. We partner with the water pollution prevention agencies and retailers that sell pesticides. The idea of this program is to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality with the intention of reducing pollutants that end up in our waterways. We will uh, offer educational materials uh, such as this rack that's uh, pictured on the far left corner. Uh, we also will have QR codes showing up in our stores soon. And then we also tag products or identify those products that are less toxic with those little blue tags that are pictured here. And these will help guide you to products that are going to not pose any harm to our waterways. They're also going to be less toxic for our families, our pets, and our environment. And because we are IPM educators, what that means is integrated pest management. We like to always start by just throwing this out there and explaining what IPM is. So it is a decision-making process that uses science-based strategies and information. We are going to uh, monitor our system as a whole, such as our garden or our home and look what's going on, if there is a problem, and if there is a problem, do we need to, you know, do we need to manage it? So uh, I notice ants coming in my house. I saw where the point of entry is, not always something we can do. And then I decided to, you know, take care of that problem. Whereas if I saw some aphids in my garden, I might wait a little bit before I take action because I want to leave them for food for the beneficial insects that might come in. Today specifically, where I should back up and say, integrated pest management is a combination of four techniques or controls. The cultural controls, which bolster the health of the garden, the mechanical controls, which are the tools that we use to manage the pests, biological controls, which is using living organisms to manage pest problems, such as beneficial insects, and then chemical controls. We do uh, want to talk about how to use pesticides. And when we do use those pesticides, we're always going to use the least toxic pro uh, possible and the most uh, narrow spectrum or narrow range. We only want to spot treat for that pest. But today we're really focusing on the cultural controls and the mechanical controls, and we'll share why. And uh, what we'd like to do is kind of relate uh, our water, our world, our program to your garden. And specifically what that looks like, well, big picture is very much, uh, we like to explain that our gardens, our properties 
are like a miniature watershed. So we understand that large watersheds are where water will flow uh, and, uh, and come down to refuel uh, reservoirs and um, streams and rivers and come all the way down to end up into a larger waterway such as the San Francisco Bay. But in our gardens, understand anything that we, oh, and I'm sorry, and along the way as that water is flowing towards that river into the bay, it is also taking with it pollutants, uh, maybe litter and debris, um, anything, you know, pet waste, anything that it might kind of capture it in its travel as it streams down towards uh, a creek, a river, and then to the bay. So with our gardens, we can use that same idea, that same analogy where we have our property and anything that we have in our gardens or around the structures of our house and garage and maybe a shed, uh, understand when we do get rains or if we happen to have an irrigation break and that water then is so much that it's going to run down the driveway or run over a sidewalk, it's going to enter a storm drain. And in that storm drain, it goes straight out to the bay and with it bringing anything that it was able to collect in its path. So maybe motor oil from changing the oil on our car on the driveway or any type of pesticides or synthetic uh, fertilizers that we may have used in the garden. So that's where we are. We just wanna bring some awareness that it's very easy to bring these pollutants into the water and that we're here to offer suggest suggestions and recommendations for a less toxic approach to our gardening practices. Awesome. Um, so what we're here to talk about is planting in the fall season and why this is the time to do so. Um, and we're going to talk about why is fall season the best time to add plants to your garden. Um, and there's several reasons why this is true. Um, so when the uh, during fall and winter, we're going to have shorter daylight hours, also um, cooler evening temperatures. So that's going to allow uh, let the less heat, so less stress on our plants. Um, it's the rainy season, so hopefully we're going to get some more rain throughout the season. And new plants, once they're in the ground there, even if they're drought tolerant or they're native or they're low water plants, when they're first put in the ground, they're still going to need a lot more water to get established. And getting established plants usually need um, a year or two to get fully established. So if you plant now, you're going to already have uh, five or six months of uh, wetter weather um, to give your plants consistent um, irrigation. So you don't also have to be using your water and going out to water all the time. It's also eight months, um, uh, well, soon in, in the fall, uh, maybe another month, it'll be eight months until the heat of the summer. Uh, we know it is still hot out there in parts of the East Bay and North Bay, um, but uh, it is the days are getting shorter and the nights are getting cooler so the heat the peak heat is get is past us um it's also 10 months until the driest summer season is upon us which is kind of right now so again if you put your plants in the ground in the next month or so um they're going to get uh several months of wetter um wetter uh uh, season um, to get established and then 10 months to get established before they're going to be really the most stressed with the, the dry summer season again. So all those reasons are why now is the time. Also great reason, plants are on sale at the nursery. So um, go to Slow and saw your other local nursery uh, to get some nice sale plants for you. Another great reason. Um, and then so when you are choosing plants for your garden, um, we want, it's um, gonna make your plants happier, gonna make you happier, um, your garden happier to choose plants that are suited for your garden. Now we live in um, a, a summer dry climate. So we wanna pick plants that are adapted to, to that climate, California natives and Mediterranean plants. Um, we're gonna match plants to the conditions of our garden. Um, because when plants are happy and they're in conditions that they like, they're going to be less stressed. And that means they're going to be less susceptible to pests. Stressed out plants um, do attract pests and they, can, they can't fight off pest infestations as well. 
You can also choose pest and disease resistant varieties, ask at your local garden center when you're there. It's helpful to uh, ask your neighbors if there's some common pests um, or, or diseases that they have um, to see uh, if you can buy a plant that's going to be more resistant to that pest. And I just want to share these little pay attention to these little tags in the plants. Um, when you're at the nursery, they're going to share that show what the water needs, the sun needs, uh, the space needs. Space is really important. You don't want to crowd your plants. That will also stress them out. Um, so take a look at these, what zone you're in and what zone the plant likes. That's going to be um, all that information is going to be really helpful to choose the right plant. And these uh, resources are, are going to be sent out to you, but these are some great resources for picking plants that are going to work for your garden. Um, there's a database at the Arboretum All Stars. You can like searchable to by zone and what you're looking for. The Basqua website, Bay Area Gardening, has like plant lists. Uh, for like lawn replacement, ground cover, things like that. The California Native Plant Society will have all your info on native plants. Then there's Calscape and your local master gardeners. There's one in Marin, Contra Costa, um, Alameda, and then San Francisco, San Mateo. And then also, of course, use your local garden centers like SLOW. The, the uh, staff is very knowledgeable and can answer a lot of questions for you. And um, back to that right plant, right place. So going uh, native and choosing plants that are gonna need less water once established will, um, will be helpful in our summer dry climate. Um, hopefully we won't be in a drought next summer, but, uh, or won't continue to be in a drought, I guess, but um, still always important to think about using less water if uh, possible. Um, we're going to group plants together with similar water needs. Also, will make your life easier. We'll make the plants happier. They're going to be next to plants that are also getting the same water. Um, we don't want to put, you know, succulents next to roses. Someone's going to be unhappy in that situation. Um, we're going to maintain our healthy soils uh, with compost, mulch, um, organic fertilizers. We're going to water wisely. So that means we're watering. Um, deeply to encourage roots to go down deep. And we're gonna wait till the top um, inch or so, depending on the size of the plant, uh, dries out before we water again. That's also gonna, that's important as you're getting your plant established. Um, when you're planting in the fall, we wanna make sure we're watering deeply, encouraging the roots go, to go down, but not soaking it. And again, we are gonna be watering more with our new plants as they get established. Hopefully the rain will come so it can take away some of that watering tasks for you. Um, mulch is definitely your friend. It's gonna lock in the moisture in the soil. It's gonna continue, it's, as it breaks down, it builds the healthy soil. It also creates habitat for beneficial insects um, and it prevents soil compaction, all things that um, are really important. Uh, for your soil and your plants. Make sure when you are adding mulch, you're keeping it away from the trunks uh, or the base of your plant. You don't wanna crowd the base of your plant um, because that can invite uh, uh, disease and other pest problems. So give the trunk a few inches of space from that mulch. And then providing regular maintenance, um, getting into your garden, monitoring, pruning as needed. Uh, any The more your time in the garden is gonna uh, make for a healthier garden. And then um, irrigation systems. If you don't have one, it might be time to consider setting one up. And if you do have one, now is the time for um, adjusting. So we're not going to adjust. We're not going to, um, because we have cooler days, cooler nights, uh, less sun, um, we're going to adjust our frequency in our watering. So we might, now that there's less evaporation because it's not quite as hot out, um, we can maybe extend the time that we water. We're still not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna decrease the amount of water we're giving our plants each time. So we're still gonna have it on for 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is at, but we might extend it to every five days versus four days or uh, just a longer frequency. Um, and we want to, so before you, before the next time it runs, go out, 
feel the soil? Is it dry? Is it still moist? Maybe you can push it out for another day or two before you water again. Because in the rainy season, or as it continually gets cooler out and hopefully more rain, you might end up extending your watering schedule for much longer or turning it off altogether. But we're gonna do that gradually. Um, and then reminding that the best time to water is four to 6 a.m. Um, early in the morning is still cool, it's much cooler. And um, uh, watering in the morning is gonna allow your plant to dry out before nightfall again, because we don't want our plants to be wet at night if we can avoid that, um, because that, will, uh, that sometimes invites uh, fungal diseases. So we're gonna avoid evening waterings and snails, snails like cool, wet temperatures as well. <laughs> and then we're gonna also make sure to inspect the system for leaks. These are not set it and forget it systems. There are a lot of um, issues that come up. Uh, we wanna make sure there's no leakages, things are spraying in the right places. Um, so make sure you're monitoring uh, your irrigation system regularly. And if you wanna learn more about irrigation, we have had previous webinars talking more in depth about it. So you could go to the SLOW um, website with uh, that lists their past webinars and watch that. And just a reminder that um, you do wanna check that irrigation for leaks because a broken or missing sprinkler head can waste as much as 25,000 gallons of water. And that's $150 a month during the irrigation system. And it is really common now to find leaks um, because there is so little water out there. Uh, critters, squirrels, rats, uh, raccoons are really in search of water. So they tend to start chewing through these tubings just to get to it. So that can cause more unexpected leaks. So again, another reason to keep um, checking. All right. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some things you can do to plan for the upcoming rainy season. And one of my favorite things to talk about is capturing that rain and keeping it on site. Because if you've been in our programs before, you know I love to share that one inch of rainfall over a thousand square foot surface, you can capture over 600 gallons of water. So there are a lot of different types of rain catchment systems out there. Of course, the picture on the left is just your average 50 or 55 gallon rain barrel. But the system on the right, uh, there are new systems designed now for urban environments, urban settings that really are long and narrow to kind of fit along the side of a house or a fence or a garage to take up less space, but to capture more water. So we want to take advantage of these systems. Uh, we can also take advantage of slowing the water flow, keeping it on site by planting a rain garden or rain basin. Uh, uh, well, I know in the 90s, it was really popular to call them dry creek beds, but I like to call them seasonal creek beds. Anything that can kind of uh, defer the water to stay on our properties, but of course, always going to flow it away from the foundations of our house or other structures, but also by uh, building an environment that's going to capture that water, keep it on site. That's what's so important. And we can do this, uh, plant these uh, beautiful gardens with California native plants that can take wet or dry conditions. So what we're looking at is planting plants. Our California natives, many of them thrive with winter rains and summer dry. And you can create so many beautiful gardens this way. This is just a sample of some flowering. Well, not all flowering. We've got our sedge and our ferns. But this is just a sample of all the beautiful plants that actually thrive in winter wet and summer dry. And I know that uh, slope brings all of these plants in. I also know that these are very common to purchase around the Bay Area. And for uh, more information on rain gardens, I did include this handout for everyone to check out, but uh, please don't limit it to just this. There's a lot of wonderful information. Sunset Magazine, I know, has an article on rain gardens. SF Gate has an article on rain gardens. And I believe a couple of at least two of the, of the three local master gardener groups have information on rain gardens. So check it out. Wait, I've lost track. Is this me or you, Charlotte? Oh, it's still me. 
Okay, so increasing permeable surfaces. Uh, again, if we're going to start any new hardscaping projects or if we want to install some paths, uh, whatever you can do is um, make sure that they're going to be permeable, that water will be able to infiltrate through. It's just going to, again, further keep that water on site. And when we can keep water on site, we're actually growing healthy soil we're growing healthy roots, we're growing healthy plants. It is really, there are so many benefits to keeping that water on site. Uh, but mainly, we really want to prevent runoff uh, because when we have excessive rains or we have a big rain event and the water is just streaming off our properties, we're overloading the storm drains. So when we have overloaded storm drains, oftentimes we also see, because it's picked up a lot of leaf debris, those storm drains get clogged and then we have other problems. It also is going to uh, prevent pollutants contaminating the waterways, as I mentioned in the beginning of our program. And then uh, we also want to keep in mind that if we do have a new landscape project and we have fresh mulch and fresh soil and compost and things like that, that we've just added to a newly planted area, we might want to take advantage of some wattles or anything else that might prevent that water as it does flow off our property to take debris with it. Okay, so that's what these really cool tools are for is to prevent any um, uh, you know, solids, any chunks like of mulch or soil to, or any other debris from getting into the storm drain. And we want to keep it, we want to be as selfish as possible and keep all of that on our own properties. It also keeps our gardens very happy and healthy when we can. All right, so now we're going to look a little bit more into some um, strategies for fall gardening for pre preventing our seasonal pests. So fall pest prevention um, can look like a lot of different things. Uh, we're gonna install barriers to exclude pests that's both in the home and in the garden. So uh, now is the time also that a lot of pests, ants, roaches, flies, uh, rodents do come into the house. So installing barriers to exclude them from coming in. And we'll talk about barriers in the garden as well. We're gonna adjust our irrigation that we, uh, that's what we talked about already. So we're gonna go for less frequency, still the same amount of water each time, but less frequency. Um, we're gonna fertilize for the winter season, especially um, in our veggie gardens. And it's always good to give your plants some more nutrition before that winter season so that they can, um, they can stay healthy and happy through the more uh, the slower growing season. Uh, we're going to selectively prune, just pr pruning out um, dead branches, damaged branches, um, anything with fungal diseases or bad uh, insect infestations can be pruned out. We're not doing a big pruning right now um, for fruit trees. We're going to wait till more till January or February. And for um, citrus, actually citrus is you can correct me if I'm wrong, Suzanne. I think this is the last time, the last right now is like the last time we want to ever prune our citrus because we don't want it to be um, susceptible to frost if that's coming in the next six weeks or so. Um, and then we're going to be sanit uh, we're going to be cleaning up the garden, making sure it's nice and clean for many reasons. Uh, we're going to plant cover crops to increase the health of our garden over the winter season. So we're not just leaving our soil bare, we can use cover crops to like reinvigorate, add nitrogen back into the soil, especially where our veggies were growing and they withdrew out a lot of nutrients. We'll talk about sheet mulching for both weed prevention, soil health, and if you want to get rid of a lawn, now is a great time for sheet mulching. Um, as we already talked about, we're going to slow the flow of water and keep it on site. And we're going to understand the seasonality and life cycle of pests. So understanding what's coming. And then, so fall maintenance around the garden, we're going to pick up any fallen food crops, um, clean up our veggie gardens, anything that's still out there and um, not uh, the past ready to pick up. Uh, we need to harvest it. Any fallen fruit and nuts, um, all of that fallen food will attract pests like yellow jackets, rats, mice, um, and raccoons. We're going to prune out fungal spores from diseased leaves um, and fruit. Uh, anything that can travel, because those can travel through water and through air, so we want to get rid of them as soon as possible so they don't travel any further than they already are. Again, we're selectively pruning, mostly just the damaged 
or dead branches. Um, if we want to open up any plants for better airflow, uh, just a little bit of pruning, nothing major right now. And then we're going to fertilize with a low nitrogen, organic low nitrogen fertilizer. So nitro high nitrogen fertilizers are more for the, especially for our veggies, the, the growing season where they're going to put up lots of leaves. Um, but now we're going to focus in the winter, we're going to focus more on the roots um, and just uh, really establishing those plants. So we're a lower nitrogen fertilizer will help with that. And again, we're gonna plant cover crops, which will help build the soil and the garden beds um, and add nitrogen back to the soil, um, increase the life in the soil, really hold that soil in place. Also covering that soil is gonna prevent the rain or when rain does come, we do want something over our soil so it doesn't get like beaten down by those drops of rain um, and break up the soil aggregates. Um, that's a whole, <laughs> I'm going to talk about soil health uh, next month in a webinar, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we can keep that soil healthy throughout the winter as well. And then we're going to work with barriers. So these are mechanical controls. That's what Suzanne mentioned at the beginning. We're going to work with physical tools, physical barriers to keep pests out. So that's row cover, um, like that, it's that white um, sheet that you can see in the middle of the slide. Netting, like bird netting, can help keep birds, um, insects, and squirrels out. Uh, gopher baskets, so whenever we're planting, so if we are going to do a big planting this fall, we do want to put most of our plants in gopher baskets. Even if you haven't seen a gopher yet, you're going to see one. Um, they are everywhere in the Bay Area, so if you it's really worth that extra couple dollars to get a gopher basket because that's going to keep your plant uh, protected, uh, the roots protected from being eaten by a gopher. Uh, we could use deer fencing to keep deer out. Even copper tape can keep snails and slugs out. Um, and then scare tape, which isn't technically a barrier, but it is a deterrent, can keep birds um, away from plants, uh, from eating your plants. And again, the exclusion uh, baskets, or not baskets, but these are cages, uh, can look a lot of different ways. They can be small, uh, like the one on the left, or you can build them so you can walk right into them, like the one on the right. Um, they uh, are really effective at keeping rodent and raccoon pests out. Um, also can help with keeping birds away from plants as well. Um, so they're just, you know, wooden frames, and we want to use quarter inch hardware cloth to keep those rodents out because that's the size that's necessary. Um, and just to reiterate that, that's for rats and mice. If you're keeping them out, you want to use quarter inch hardware cloth. That's because rats and mice can fit through a hole the size of pencil, three eighths inch. So quarter inch is a little bit smaller than that. Hardware cloth is a material that they cannot shoot through. It's like a wire mesh with um, steel, galvanized steel, and uh, they can't chew through that, you want to use quarter inch for them. If you are making, um, you can make your own gopher baskets with half inch hardware cloth, that's the size that gophers cannot fit through. Also, if you're installing a raised bed, you do want to line that raised bed with gopher wire all the way up the sides, and you can use half inch hardware cloth for that. If you're preventing squirrels, you can use three quarter inch fencing or poultry wire, it's a little bit bigger. And then if you are preventing deer, you want to do at least seven feet tall. They can jump over anything smaller than that. And if you're on a slope, it might need to be taller, actually. And other tools for prevention in the home, we're going to use, again, that same hardware cloth over any holes um, and any vents that uh, rodents can come through. Um, we're going to use caulk in our windows uh, or in other, any other uh, crevices that ants or other crawling insects can come through. Weather stripping will also keep ants and roaches out. Um, these little uh, galvanized metal door, <laughs> I don't know what they're called, but they keep, uh, they can prevent uh, rodents from coming in a garage door. Sometimes the corner of the door can be chewed off, but these steel uh, corners can prevent them from um, uh, coming in that way. Also screens, excellent way to just keep some flying insects out. Um, and door sweeps are really important, especially Suzanne informed me that um, 
uh, door sweeps are the number one way to keep cockroaches from coming in your home. I'll just add that the galvanized metal, metal corners that's pictured here, these are just gutter uh, patch pieces. So yeah, really easy to find uh, and work really well at keeping a lot of pests like rodents out. All right, and another really um, uh, something you can do during the fall in preparation for winter is um, sheet mulching. And people do this for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's a great way to get rid of a lawn uh, or a part of a lawn. It's a great way to cover an area that you know is gonna get covered in weeds. Maybe it doesn't have any planting, it's just bare soil. You know it's gonna grow a lot of weeds. So sheet mulching over that area is gonna prevent those weeds from growing. Um, or if you just have some soil that needs to be regenerated, add some new life to it, um, you can also do sh sheet mulching for that. And that all sheet mulching is, is um, using many layers of cardboard. I recommend three layers overlapping. That's gonna help keep oxalis and other really pesky weeds out. Um, overlapping, and then you can put mulch on top. Some people also add compost either underneath the cardboard or on top of the cardboard underneath the mulch. That is your choice. If you are planning to, um, you know, if you're doing it to regenerate your soil, then you probably do want to add that compost in. In the rainy season, the water comes in. It's going to slowly break down those materials and um, increase the life and the health of your soil. Um, you do want to make sure you, when if uh, you're doing like a lawn area, you want to cut away from the edges so that um, you don't spill over <laughs> onto the whatever the walkway or whatever is next to it. You want to kind of slope it down a little because you are going to add a good, you know, four or five inches or four inches on top of the, the lawn. Um, you want to mark where you have any sprinkler heads so you can cut a around them and um, we'll talk about that in a second and then we're going to just layer the cardboard and definitely through at least three inches of mulch or again a compost a, a combo of compost and mulch um, on top that's going to properly keep those pests or weed pests out and if you do some people want to plant right into this area um, instead of or you can either wait for a whole season um, and let that kind of break down or you can plant directly into it as you're building this uh, sheet mulching area so you can you want to cut out holes in the cardboard um, and plant in to those holes uh, you might need to add some fertilizer or compost directly into the planting hole, especially depending on the, the health of your soil in that area. Um, organic fertilizer, you're going to make enough room, you're going to put that three to four inches of mulch around, but make sure it's not crowding around that plant, you do want to give it some space. Um, and then you're going to make sure if you do have drip irrigation, you're going to put it underneath Put it, lay it down before you put the mulch on because you're going to put the mulch on top of that. Uh, you're going to water them in well and make sure you continue to water them as they get established. Um, and there is a method if you already have a sprinkler system um, in, your, uh, in your yard from a lawn or from whatever uh, irrigation system you have, there is a way to convert it into drip which might be more beneficial if you're planting perennials. And I believe there are some rebates to help um, with this lawn conversion or, and um, uh, irrigation conversion as well. Yeah, and check out all of, uh, each municipality has a different assortment of uh, rebates and you wanna be, have a good understanding of the rebate before you start any of the projects because oftentimes they actually need to uh, have someone come out and audit the situation to approve the rebate. But anyway, lots of free money out there for us. So take, take advantage of it when you can. So now I'm going to go through uh, uh, what integrated pest management or IPM looks like for a few of our common pest problems. So ants, this is the time of year where we start seeing ants coming into our house, but uh, we also see a lot of ants outside in the garden. So if we do have ants outside, oftentimes uh, ants are an amazing indicator for me. I, I actually welcome uh, the sight of ants. So if I see an ant uh, trailing up one of my fruit trees or like an abutilon or anything else that's a shrub, 
or perennial or tree, typically it's an indicator uh, that there is another pest such as aphids or scale. Uh, and the reason why is because aphid scale and a few other uh, pests are uh, do secrete a sticky substance called honeydew, which the ants like to farm. And they'll actually trail up and grab that honeydew and bring it back down to their colony. So we that's an indicator. I want to take care of those aphids or I want to take care of that scale insect. But then I can also create a barrier with something like tanglefoot or a sticky insect glue. And we always want to make sure we're putting that sticky substance on some type of a banding material so that we can always remove it. We don't want to put it directly onto the plant. And then there's outdoor ant controls that are eco-friendly, such as uh, bait stations with uh, the boric acid or uh, baits that are going to also contain spinosad. These are going to be eco-friendly, less toxic. However, we do only want to target the ants and we want to avoid other uh, critters or uh, kids or anybody else that's non-targeted to access these. So what I've learned is now I actually put an opened up gopher basket anchored down with some landscape pins over my ant bait station. So now that only ants can access it and no other outdoor critters. And then for inside, what we're going to do is we're going to notice when those little scouts start coming into the house, we're just going to remove them and clean up their scent trails because that's what they're doing. They're coming in and looking for food and water. And so essentially, and then they're going to go back and let everybody know, hey, I found the jackpot. Well, we want to avoid that. So what we're going to do is we're going to kill those scouts, clean up those scent trails simply with just soap and water. And then as uh, Charlotte mentioned before, sealing up any cracks and crevices with a fresh bead of caulk is going to prevent any crawling insects from coming in. And then again, that new weather stripping and door sweeps are also going to be wonderful tools that are very inexpensive to apply. And then if we do have an infestation, knowing that uh, bait stations are more effective at killing uh, ants than sprays, but know that you have a nice option of uh, some eco-friendly ant bait stations, as well as Orange Guard and other eco-friendly sprays that are going to be really wonderful and not toxic to our uh, home, our pets, or our families. And then uh, some other products that are really common, especially diatomaceous earth, we see this a lot on the internet and a lot of people reference this, uh, but I also wanted to share that boric acid uh, in the granular form as opposed to the liquid form, which is in those ant bait stations. I wanted to just share the difference between the two. So they're both excellent for crawling insects. Uh, boric acid is going to be a little bit more narrow range. It's really going to target cockroaches, ants, and silverfish. Uh, boric acid, when it's in the dry form, is going to be about the size of a grain of salt. And what we do is we put it in cracks and crevices, or maybe in the frame of a wall, a light dusting, anywhere we, we know cockroaches or ants are going to crawl over it, uh, but no one else or nothing else can access it. So we wanna make sure we're keeping it away from like pets, especially pets that like to breathe or lick like the floor, things like that. What happens is, is that ants and cockroaches are grooming insects. So they are able to then uh, have this boric acid on their little uh, hands, so to speak, and then they're going to groom themselves and that's how they ingest it, which then the boric acid is going to disrupt the uh, bacteria and in their uh, digestive, throughout their digestive system, which leads to starvation. Whereas diatomaceous earth, which is completely inert, it is not toxic at all. It is a very fine dust, like, uh, like chalk dust, okay? If anyone remembers using some chalk on a chalkboard, they get that dust on their hands. That is really what diatomaceous earth, that's how fine it is. It comes from crushed diatoms from the ocean waters. And when we can apply it, getting it again in cracks and crevices or in areas where these undesirable pests will be located, we want to uh, understand it gets on, that dust gets on their exoskeleton uh, or their exterior and it dehydrates them. Uh, the only thing is, is understand that diatomaceous earth, because it's so fine, it can be a lung and eye irritant. So we really want to be mindful not to breathe it in. We want to wear our masks and we want to make sure we're not getting it in our eyes. Okay. And we also want to make sure that again, uh, if we do put it in some cracks or crevices around the house, that uh, pets can't sniff it and that children can't have access to it. 
Other than that, completely non-toxic and safe. And then, you know, this has been a big year for gophers and moles. I'm not exactly sure why. I don't know where all of our predator creatures are to take care of them, keeping them in balance. But what I wanted to share is that I get a lot of questions all the time in the aisles about gophers and moles. And so first, straight out the bat, identification is key, right? So gophers, uh, they are the ones that are eating the root systems of your plants. Uh, they are definitely will come up and actually feed off of your squash or tomatoes. I just had one get into my raised bed and actually gnaw off the stem of my tomatoes. My tomatoes were in a basket and I was like, what the heck? We've been talking about it in some of our other programs. If you see something wilted, check it. And guess what happened to me? We're not always going to see their tunnels because they do tunnel a little deeper. Okay. Their tunnels are typically six to 12 inches below the surface of the soil. They have very extensive uh, burrowing systems that are really advanced, surprisingly advanced. And when they do create a mound, typically it's more of like a fan shape or crescent shape. It's typically not a perfect, you know, uh, like volcano shaped mound. Whereas moles, Moles are eating bugs. I find them to be very beneficial because they are eating a lot of the larval stages of pest insects that I see around my garden. So I actually welcome the moles. Uh, they eat actually, what is it? I think a hundred times their weight in insects alone on a daily basis. So it's a lot. Uh, what I'd like to share is that they're going to be more shallow tunnelers. So we actually see their tunneling systems. They are tunneling just about four to eight inches below the surface. And again, they have very elaborate burrowing systems, but it, there still can be a problem. So let's look at gophers. So the way we deal with gophers is with prevention. As Charlotte mentioned, we're going to plant everything in a gopher basket. Yeah, I know that's extra money, but trust me, it is going to save your plants. The last thing you want is to see that plant to get, you know, uh, demolished by a gopher by the gopher's enjoyment. Um, yes, that uh, uh, butternut squash on the left was from my garden. Uh, it was quite surprising. I was so proud of my prize winning butternut. And when I went out to go harvest it the one day after watching it grow, for weeks, I discovered that a gopher got to it before me. And it is outrageous, right, when that happens. But uh, we wanna do whatever we can. So lining raised beds with that half inch hardware cloth or gopher wire, but also putting a skirt around the raised beds for our vining food crops, such as squash. So now not only do I have that uh, the, my raised beds lined, but I also have a skirt around my raised beds where I know that food crops might be lying right on the ground because I know that gophers are smart and they're still going to access it. And working with traps is actually the most humane and effective way to manage uh, a larger gopher population. However, it's not for everybody uh, and it can actually be quite discouraging, but let me share that persistence and patience is key. You can learn more about setting traps and how, how to set them and how to place them. UCIPM has a YouTube channel and there's a wealth of information there. So if you'd like to learn more about trap placement or setting certain and traps, go there and check out these videos. And then you might ask, what about gassers or baits? Well, I'll share that gophers are really, really smart and they're fast. They can actually close off a tunnel system faster than a blink of an eye. So uh, when gassers or anything else undesirable is um, sensed in their tunnel, they will just close that tunnel off. Uh, they'll still have the rest of the burrow system to enjoy until that gas has dissipated. And then they might come back to that, open up that tunnel. However, you haven't necessarily eliminated that gopher. Baits actually are also going to be questionable. They are not a natural food source for gophers, and they have been known to push those baits out, now making it accessible to pets, wildlife, and children to access. So those are also not recommended. Moles, again, as I mentioned, they're shallow uh, tunnelers. It's hard to see in this picture, but there's actually a kind of a snaking tunnel that's on this uh, lawn area. Um, and, you know, the, again, their mounds are going to be really perfectly uh, circular or like look like a volcano. And there'll be multiple mounds kind of along almost like a volcanic byway, so to speak. So since moles are going for the grubs and other uh, 
larval stages of our of insects, the best way to manage moles is to remove their food source. And we remove their food source by applying beneficial nematodes. Uh, Sloat does sell beneficial nematodes. You can call the store and see if they have any in stock. We're really at the end of that season. So we want to apply these now before the soil temperatures get too much cooler, because when the soil temperatures cool, all of those larval stages, those grubs and other larvae actually will drop down into the warmth of the soil. And for more information on uh, moles and gophers or other uh, critters that are we might see in the garden, you can check out the fact sheets at the rwaterourworld.org website. All right, and we got a few more critters for you to talk about, so for us to talk about. So raccoons and urban critters. I don't know if any of you in San Francisco or otherwise have seen something like this. Maybe the, they saw this picture in the, in the uh, SF gate or maybe in real life they saw a gang of raccoons, but uh, it's a little scary. Um, uh, but yes, raccoons are everywhere and they're um, very smart. And uh, they, um, so we're gonna talk about how to keep them out of our yards. So some things uh, with, again, with um, the gophers, the moles, any rodents, any ants, the idea is we're gonna keep, remove their food source and remove places where they can get in or where they can hide. So we're gonna focus on keeping them, <coughs> excuse me, keeping them out of our homes with hardware cloth on attic vents and in um, eaves on roofs. We're gonna keep the food sources away by securing our garbage and compost our green waste cans. We're gonna keep our cats and um, dogs in at night, no letting our pets out because that's gonna uh, be dangerous for your pets also and can harm the raccoons and can maybe even attract them as well. We're definitely not leaving pet food outside. If you do feed your pets outside, leave it out for a short period and clean up after it. Do not leave it outside for a long period of time because uh, rats and raccoons and other urban critters are gonna find it. Secure so your uh, chicken coops, uh, also with um, hardware cloth to keep the raccoons away. Secure your compost bins um, with hardware cloth or secure um, you know, wood or any other kind of barrier. Uh, you just want it really tight and lock that lid. Raccoons can lift and, unlock their, their little hands are very, very, um, they're very skilled with their little hands. Uh, we, harvesting your food crops as soon as they're ready and cleaning up any fallen fruit from fruit trees. So if anyone has a lawn or freshly laid sod or anything, this might look very familiar. This is not your neighborhood kids playing tricks on you. This is likely from raccoons. They are lifting up that lawn, lifting up that sod to look for that nice layer of insects, grubs, um, and other uh, little insects uh, in the soil to munch on. That's what they're going for. So some ways to prevent them from pulling this up, pulling the turf up or digging up your lawn is um, to keep your lawn really healthy. A healthy lawn is going to grow really nice strong roots. Um, so it's gonna be harder to roll up. They still might dig in it, but it's gonna be um, healthier. Also healthier turf has less um, like grub issues <laughs> um, and other pest issues. We're gonna use exclusion when possible. And so with a lawn or any kind of, this can be applied for cats, squirrels, any other uh, critter digging in your mulch or your soil um, exclusion and using barriers like poultry wire on top of the soil, the mulch, or the lawn, um, or bird netting, or any kind of, um, they have these like cat scratch things that you can lay down on your soil and are very, and are deterrent for cats. Um, you just want to prevent them to be able, from being able to dig um, and have it kind of like unpleasant for them. So poultry wire, bird netting on top of the soil, staking it down with irrigation stakes, um, again, removing the food sources. If there's no food for them to eat, either in the lawn, in the, in the garden, uh, they're gonna go away. They're gonna find it somewhere else. Um, so overall, by removing the food sources and creating a barrier, we're training those animals that there is no reward for being in this, um, in this yard. 
and a reminder that it is unlawful to feed the wildlife. That includes um, coyotes, raccoons, and much larger predators as well. So, um, and that also can include accidentally or purposefully leading, leaving pet food out for your animals. So always keep that pet food either inside or clean up after you feed them outside. And we're never actively feeding raccoons because um, that is against the law. And it just enhances the problems that we have in our yards. And again, just uh, we beneficial nematodes are a great way to remove that food source as Suzanne already mentioned. So both with moles and with raccoons, if we remove those food sources, those grubs and insects in the soil, then we're gonna reduce the um, attractiveness of our lawns to those critters. And trapping is kind of, is sometimes an option um, or I know that some traps are sold in stores. Um, but I will just share that in the state of California, it is illegal to move wildlife. So if you do catch it on site, you have to release it on site. You can't move it, moving the wildlife, even if it's just to the park next door or um, you know, another park or wherever, moving it can actually be inhumane because you're removing that animal from its home, you're putting it in an unfamiliar place where it doesn't know where the food is, uh, food sources are, you're uh, mixing populations, it could, it could spread disease, it could cause other conflicts. Um, so we are not, we don't, um, we can't, we're not moving wildlife, <laughs> just to make it simple. And for more information on um, how to uh, manage wildlife, especially with trapping laws and regulations, um, you can go to the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife for information on that. Um, there are also rules on how um, to uh, properly euthanize um, animals. Um, you can't suffocate or drown them or use a firearm or relocate them. So you're, you're um, Options are pretty limited, but this is an excellent, I just wanna share also, this is an excellent book to learn about keeping wildlife away from homes and gardens or managing that those pests. There's also an excellent wildlife pest ID tool, the UCIPM website, that's ipm.ucanr.edu, that's on your resource list. Um, this is gonna help uh, you figure out what uh, wildlife might be causing damage in your yard. And more resources for you for pest identification and treatment. So our, the Our Water, Our World website, we have all of our fact sheets online. We have locations of where, what stores partner with us. And then the UCIPM website, excuse me, has that wildlife tool. It has a really wealth of knowledge of every pest in California. Um, and it actually has this great tool that I like to use when we don't know for, for identification, when we don't know what we're looking at, we can use this kind of a symptom tracker tool to figure out um, you know, what the damage is, where the damage is, what kind it is, and it'll what kind of plant it is. All those clues will help narrow it down and help us figure out what is, on, what is going on with our plant. Maybe it's a nutrient deficiency, maybe it is a pest or a disease. Um, there's also the bug guide, bugguide.net for helping with identification and pesticide, National Pesticide Information Center can help um, with information on pesticide use and safety. And then some issues do require a uh, professional and there, uh, we do have a fact sheet on hiring a pest control company, what to ask, what to talk to them about um, if they do use IPM processes. And then there's also a UC IPM pest note on how to hire a pest control company and what to expect with that. And with that, um, thank you. Wow, we did it in an hour. <laughs> Good job, Suzanne. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here and spending time with us. Thank you for your questions and we'll continue answering your questions as well. I know there's some again, good, and so having us. good questions that came up. Thank you um, both. That was so yeah. awesome. Um, I hope, you know, I hope everybody is not scared to garden because, you know, there is a lot of stuff to think about, but I think 
what's really valuable about what you're saying is to understand that gardening really is sort of multi-layered and there's a lot of different uh, things to sort of think about and get on top of and in place now that will really make your gardening life a lot easier as you go forward. So that's why we want you to know all of this information and things to look out for and whatnot. Um, I wanted to say a couple comments. I know you're gonna talk a little bit more, but um, I wanted to say one thing to remember now is, uh, now is the best time to for planting everything and obviously drought tolerant and native plants are in that group. But I do want to remind you that plants aren't considered drought tolerant until they're considered established. And so that can, depending on the plant that can take between eight and like 12 months. So we are offsetting the water budget right now by planting and using some of the rains um, in through the winter, but it's possible that you might still have to ha give those drought tolerant plants regular water as they still are becoming established. So I just think it's really common. People think like drought tolerant, you can just put it in the ground and not water it uh, immediately. And so just keeping that in mind. And then I did want to note that we are, if you are interested in learning about getting rid of your lawn and what you can put in place of that. We are having a webinar on October 9th with Bonnie Morse um, and she will be talking about um, lawn substitutes and putting in place systems that increase uh, more biodiversity and are more drought tolerant and whatnot. So anyway, thank Bonnie, you. Bonnie's awesome. You will learn so much from her. She is a gem. So that is so exciting to hear that that class is coming up. Thanks. I'd Jen. love to, I'd love to get us for on, a, we got to come up because that would be super awesome. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. group to have for a webinar. Absolutely. Um, well, I saw, I just, one comment that came up on the Q and a was, um, how on earth did that gopher eat my squash? I, I want to that. <laughs> say that uh, the gophers are really smart and um, they just come up and, uh, you know, under the ground, they, I'm not sure like how they're able to, de to detect that there is some yummy food for them, but they can figure it out. And then they just start gnawing. And um, there's even a video on my Instagram from last year where a, there was a large zucchini squash, you know, one of those super sized ones that you forgot about. And then it just appeared. And then we lifted it up and this, the gopher had completely hollowed it out, completely hollowed out. It was just feeding on it. So, you know, that gopher had this big fat belly and was so happy. So yeah, that's why exclusion. So making those skirts or putting down that uh, half inch hardware cloth or gopher wire in those areas where your vining food crops are going to be vining on top of is going to prevent those uh, subterrain critters from coming up and eating them. I also, yeah, also there was rat, you know, it could, rats can oh, yeah. do, some, do some damage too. There's a few questions about rats. They're, they're gross. We don't like rats. But, yeah. Um, you anyway. can find uh, both Charlotte and myself on Instagram. Our Instagram handles are right here on this page. I am at plant harmony and Charlotte is at, at earth.ally. So please, it's really fun. Um, I can also share that someone asked about ants and chicken coops and if boric acid is toxic. Um, I would not, boric acid is um, the way it works. It's very low in toxicity. It's grams to weight. So if I were to eat, eat an entire bottle of boric acid, it might be lethal to me. But if I just have, because my weight is so big compared to a little gram of boric acid, it wouldn't, um, or it could actually maybe not be lethal, but give me a tummy ache. I don't know what would be, uh, what volume would be lethal to a human that weighs this much, but 
chickens don't weigh that much. So I wouldn't really want to expose them to that because I'm not sure how much would be um, okay and how much wouldn't be okay. So really we're always looking at exclusion. So what are what is the critter going for in this case? Are the ants going for the chicken feed or are they going for the water? Well, then let's prevent them from accessing that. When we can prevent the access, then we're going to prevent the problem. Um, and that goes for someone's asking wild hogs to uh, that are destroying a lawn. Sadly, um, the, or I should say for you, you might not like that answer, but you would have to put some type of a barrier. So putting, uh, excluding that lawn, making some decorative fencing around it or removing the lawn and planting some other things. But ultimately, if you've got wild hogs, they can really be quite uh, a problem as are wild turkeys, as are a lot of other of the urban critters that we're faced with. So exclusion, putting a fence around those areas or in the case of turkeys, you know, um, again, that those really wonderful exclusion structures that it's very common nowadays because everyone, it seems, is faced with some type of uh, urban critter problem or pests like rodents um, and other things. So this is now the norm. So I guess that's what Charlotte and I really always like to kind of share is in very subtle ways that this is the new norm. This is how we all manage pest problems. Everyone is faced with pest problems. I know that sometimes when we're faced with them, it's really um, devastating. It's overwhelming. It's like, oh my gosh. But we know that the best way to prevent them is to uh, prevent access. So if we are growing food crops or we have something that we think is beautiful and we want to maintain it for its splendor, then we need to prevent these urban critters and other pests access to these areas that we like to enjoy. So, um, and then is yeah. uh, artificial turf a target for these animals as well? Well, it kind of depends how the artificial turf was installed. If it is just right on top of the um, soil, then possibly, but typically I see that Charlotte maybe has answered it. It um, maybe we're, we're not growing or cultivating a nice habitat that is going to maybe even attract any uh, larvae pests. Charlotte, mm -hmm. anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, you might still have, I don't really know how if moles would travel underneath the artificial turf, but if there's no food for them, yeah, I guess not. I don't really know much about artificial they, turf. I mean, the, <laughs> most turf, I think, goes, you put like, it goes 10 inches down and there's like a substrate and whatnot. There's not a ton of food. There's not like soil typically or, you know, food source yeah. under there. So anyway, well, this has been super awesome. Tons of information. I do want to remind everyone that the recording will be available on Tuesday. What's nice about the recordings is that you can go back and rewind and screenshot and whatnot. Um, all of our, uh, I just got a note from, from the, the president of Slow Garden Center that there's been a lot of requests, a lot of questions if the recordings are still available. Yes, we, all of this information is on our website, all the recordings from previous webinars. I think this is like our 29th or our 30th webinar right now that we've done over the past year. So all of that information is on our website and accessible and free. So feel free to um, check it out, check out the recordings um, because there's a ton of information there. Like Suzanne and Charlotte were saying, they've done classes before on water-wise gardening and classes on composting. And I mean, literally there's like so much information there to check out um, for more of your specific questions. I do um, uh, just thank everybody for joining us. It's a nice day out today. So hope you get out in the garden and um, think about your, your fall planting and what you're gonna do. Thanks Suzanne and Charlotte. Thank you very thank much. You. As always, it's super fun to have you. Thank you so much. We love it. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks so have much. Okay, bye. bye. Bye.